Over the New Year weekend, there was a massive power shortage at the Manila International Airport, which affected more than 350 flights. It grounded more than 60,000 passengers. It happened at Manila's Ninoy Aquino International Airport, making global headlines and underscoring the depth of the infrastructure problems faced by the Philippines. The sudden power outage resulted in long queues and chaotic scenes at check-in counters across the country. Thousands of Filipinos who had come home for the holidays desperately scrambled to rebook their flights and get back to work. Many of them complained that they would lose their jobs because of this massive power outage. And a country that can fill this big infrastructure gap in the Philippines is China, which is uniquely placed through its Belt and Road Initiative. It is in this backdrop that the Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. will be undertaking his maiden visit to China since coming to office. This is his first major foreign trip since being elected last summer. On Crux Decode, how is China using countries like the Philippines and to a lesser extent Nepal and Sri Lanka and the yawning infrastructure gaps in these countries to push its flagship Belt and Road Initiative? And oftentimes, this leaves the recipient countries hugely debt trapped. Where does this leave the United States in its great power game with China? And what do smaller countries, how do they walk this diplomatic tightrope between an ambitious and aggressive Beijing and a reluctant but still massively powerful Washington? The airport mayhem in the Philippines underscored an even more fundamental energy crisis that the country has been seeing for the last few years. In fact, last year saw massive blackouts across the Philippines, coinciding also with big electricity rate hikes. This in turn led major corporate houses to warn about economic disruptions in the country. Some of them even left the Philippines because power had become expensive and unreliable. The country's energy secretary had said that things are not likely to get any time better anytime soon. The country's biggest source of natural gas, the Malampaya field, is expected to be fully used up by the end of next year. Faced with massive public debt and inflation, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is desperately in need for foreign capital and investment. And the only country which has both the money and the muscle which can help him out is China. China has been pushing its trademark Belt and Road Initiative with other smaller countries in Asia as well. It has flooded countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka and Nepal with huge and well-funded infrastructure projects from hydroelectric dams to high-speed trains. And like in the case of some of these countries, in this instance Sri Lanka, it has been to the detriment of public finances in that country. The economic crisis that was seen in Sri Lanka last year was in good measure caused because of China's unsustainable loans to build some of these massive infrastructure projects. But that is not stopping some of these smaller countries from going to Beijing hat in hand. In Nepal earlier this year, in a dramatic turn of events, a new left-leaning government headed by a former Maoist guerrilla fighter, Prachanda, came to power after some deft political power play. Prachanda ditched the ruling coalition that he was a part of. It was led by Nepal's oldest political party, the Nepali Congress. And instead, he joined hands with his one-time rival, K.P. Sharma Oli, who is perceived to be backed by Beijing. Now, this was considered a political coup of sorts, something that has delighted Beijing and raised concerns both in Washington and in New Delhi. The previous government, led by the NC's Sher Bahadur Duba, was seen to be pursuing a stronger relationship with both India and the United States while insisting that Nepal wants grants and not commercial loans for these infrastructure projects. Now that comment of the former Prime Minister was interpreted as a critique of China's Belt and Road Initiative. And right after being sworn into office, China's acting ambassador met Prachanda to congratulate him. He also conveyed that Beijing had lifted the suspension of business and supply of goods from two checkpoints, Rasuba Karung and Hilsa Parang II, which had not been commissioned since the COVID-19 pandemic. China is a lot more comfortable working with Prachanda and Oli. Firstly, they were able to sign many trade and infrastructure projects with Nepal during Oli's previous regime. In addition, there is a perception 
that the Nepali Congress headed by Sher Bahadur Duba was pro-India and pro-United States. In fact, the previous government had started dampening the prospects of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it said that Nepal would prefer projects given to it as grants and not loans. Also, the Nepal parliament had ratified the $500 million Millennium Challenge Corporation back in February under the previous regime. What that did was effectively overrule Chinese objections. It awarded two mega hydroelectric power projects, the West Seti and the Seti Water projects worth 120 megawatts and two and a half billion dollars to the United States instead of China. So the question now is, what is going to be the fate of these smaller countries in this great power game that's going on between the United States and China? Will there be a cyclical change of fortunes? Well, as we see in Indonesia, where the Maritime Silk Road Initiative was announced by Xi Jinping more than a decade ago, there's now been massive pushback forcing the Jokowi government there to discard some of these Chinese projects altogether. Even in a China-friendly country like Pakistan, there have been local-level protests against the Gwadar port, as well as projects in the northern areas, so much so, many Chinese engineers and other project managers who were working in these projects were targeted in terrorist attacks, so much so, in many of these projects, now there is Chinese security in addition to local Pakistani security. All in all, many of these smaller countries will have to walk this diplomatic tightrope. Right now, they risk becoming the collateral damage when these two big giants, the United States and China, collide. But like Sri Lanka discovered, they could end up rocking their own boat and sinking their own ship if they don't manage their public finances well.